Uh, yeah, so um, I'm Skip Crilly. I work at the uh, Green Bank Observatory. I've been there since 2014, and uh, a lot of you have used the 40-foot telescope there. Um, I had the fantastic opportunity to, to volunteer, and they gave me responsibility to upgrade that telescope and add uh, some some features to it, some improvements to the existing hardware. So I've been doing that since 2014. And, um, and I've given a few presentations on SETI, um, well, more than a few, maybe, <laughs> for those of you who've been listening for about, you know, five years or so. Um, this presentation is going to be on um, basically, it covers four archive papers that I wrote during the pandemic that cover the work that we've been doing since 2017 when uh, Rich Russell and I were at a CERA meeting and uh, we were talking about ideas for using multiple dishes for, for SETI, for detection of pulses. And that's something that um, has not normally been done very often in, in the search extraterrestrial intelligence and it's being pushed more and more because the the radio frequency interference hypothesis is extremely difficult to refute and practically all of this work that's been going on for so long ends up with people saying well it's rfi you know and we can't really show otherwise so the idea of using multiple dishes came along so about uh, half of this presentation is going to be on the multiple dish um, project that we we ran until the beginning of 2020, and uh, and then the pandemic came and I couldn't go to the 40 foot dish um, during the pandemic, and then about half of this is going to be on single dish work, which of course brings back the RFI hypothesis um, using the uh, radio telescope that I built on my farm. And that'll, that'll be about half it. Okay, so I'll go to the, maybe if we could just go to the introduction. Um, next slide. So um, I think I've covered most of this. Um, we are, um, the conclusions are uncertain. So, you know, at this point, it's hard to say what's causing these, these sort of strange results, but there do seem to be some pretty strange results. And if you want to get a lot of detail about this, um, you can just Google Archive Krilly Interstellar. Um, I put Interstellar in the title of each one of those these four archive papers. Archive is a Cornell University scientific paper archive that's moderated. And it's, it's really, really good. Um, I'm, I'm really happy with it. And it, uh, it allows you to, to, to kind of keep things sorted out and straight and, and and refer them for other people to read. And uh, so that's what I've been using now for these four papers. Two of them were, were in 2020 and two of them went in in 20, uh, 20, 2021 rather, and two of them went in in 2022. Okay, so the next slide has pictures of the uh, telescopes that we've been using. Um, so the Deep Space Exploration Society 60 foot dish in Colorado, uh, is it a fantastic location with very low RFI and uh, very controlled RFI. Um, the Green Bank 40-foot telescope uh, is shown there with the uh, the Green Bank telescope is in the background. It's You can see the arm sticking up from the trees there just to the right of the base. Um, and then uh, the 26-foot dish I, I presented at a previous um, Sarah presentation. Um, on uh, the, the construction that was going on in that telescope. And that's also on YouTube. So if, if you go to a YouTube channel, Skip Grilly, um, I go through how, how it sort of works. It's already built. Uh, it goes through uh, sort of how I can rotate an azimuth and elevation, that sort of thing, and uh, how I can adjust the focus. Okay, so what we're doing is pointing these antennas so they have overlapping beams the overlapping beams are set on a declination of minus 7.6 degrees. And we just let the Earth rotate through that and run the telescopes for typically between two and three days and a week. And we scan over and over again um, that range. Steep block, uh, 
uh, has been going neat to Haswell, Colorado dish uh, starting in, in late 2017. Actually, Rich Russell ran the first one in late 2017 when we were testing it, testing the system out. Um, I drive to the Green Bank uh, Observatory and start up the software that I, I've written in, in, in computers. So there's computers at each one of these locations that's running software that I've written. It captures pulses um, and does FFTs and uh, sort of calls the data down. So it's about, it's got about 70 megabyte files per four hours. The idea being is, is that it's impossible to store raw data and we're not using the telescopes to communicate with each other to try to look for pulses that are at the same time. So it all has to be done through post-processing and, that, and that's that's how that works. Um, so uh, yeah, so so the, the, um, the papers go through the results of all of that. And I'm going to, I'm going to summarize the, the particular observations that occurred that um, seem to point to a direction in the sky where something unusual seems to be happening. And that's on the next slide in the hypothesis that I've put together. So when, when we try to say what, what are we guessing could, could be causing, might be causing uh, some unusual effects. Um, there, there, there are so many hypotheses in SETI that I, you know, we, I really feel, figure we've got to start at something simple and just work our way up from there. And I started with just saying, let's just say that these pulses are due to noise. And we can calculate what we expect to see if the telescopes are just producing noise and, then, and we're looking for simultaneous signals um, synchronized with GPS and do correct Doppler offsets for the rotation of the earth um, and, and say, well, is it noise? Well, yeah, the statistics say that it shouldn't occur due to noise. The other thing that's very beneficial in the system is that because we continually scan the minus 7.6 declination arc day in and day out, it gives us information and, and data and calculations about what's going on in various right ascensions. And so probably one of the most powerful things in the system is that it's also a right ascension filter. So if, if simultaneous pulses are occurring at a particular right ascension, then we can say, well, there's something unusual happening at that one. And then the question is, is it repeating over days, and then is it repeating over months and years? Uh, does that uh, location continue to have something? Now, there there is a, a professor at at Berkeley, um, David Messerschmidt, who's written an excellent uh, paper on the idea of communication systems in interstellar um, uh, between stars. So, communicating between stars, how would we do that? And it's it's a very extensive paper, but it's it's available in archive. And um, uh, I've used that as an idea for saying, well, what what kinds of of propagation impairments are going to occur in interstellar space that lead to the design of a communication system? And the ideas that that he has written about and that have been written about for the last fifty years um, by various researchers and said he has led to the idea of searching for a particular type of signal and the idea that the signals are being transmitted all the time without particular uh, discovery signals that last a long time on one frequency. In other words, is it possible to detect pulses that are present on two, on two antennas or even on one antenna scanning over, over a long period of time? And, and it is possible to do that without having to park the frequency, park the signal on one frequency for long periods of time. And so the idea has been that there might be elements within a wideband communication system that's using lots and lots of bandwidth. So it has high capacity, but also has elements within it, which are narrow bandwidth and are, are relatively easy to detect in a uh, with a with a fast Fourier transform system like the uh, the one I used, and uh, the system uses a 3.7 hertz bandwidth. 
and captures pulses in quarter second intervals. And it only stores signals that are above a signal to noise ratio threshold that's set in the software. And that calls the data enormously uh, down from e each of the digitizers is producing about five gigabits per second into the host processors. And there's six digitizers on the home computer that I have. So there's so much data going in there that it really, it really needs to be called, called down. Um, let's see. Oh, and, and it covers 50 megahertz of bandwidth. So from 1400 to 1450 megahertz. And I, I don't have a slide for a lot of specifications. So it, it, uh, please interrupt if there's a question, you know, about something, you know, pretty important, like what frequency am I looking at? And, and that's, um, you know, that, that's, that's what we do. It's a 50 megahertz bandwidth running on each one of the telescopes. Okay, so the next slide shows what a polarized pulse pair is. So the idea is, is that if, if someone concentrates the power in their wideband communication signal into particular narrow bandwidth elements that last for a period of time adequate to be able to get a matched filter on that power and integrate it sufficiently, and the time necessary to do that is one over the bandwidth. So in this case, I take 0.26 seconds and of 3.7 Hertz bandwidth and capture pulses that occur um, above an, a signal to noise ratio threshold to the file. And each one of the computers then has that file that's created every four hours. Um, these pairs may be part of a communication signal that is has much higher bandwidth than 50 megahertz and might have components within it that are at a lower signal to noise ratio and that these are maybe the elements of a discovery signal but they're elements of a discovery signal that provide some data so in other words by taking the time offset and the frequency offset between the polarized pairs we can digitize data we can we can transmit information we could for example quantize the frequency offset in certain intervals um, naturally using a 3.7 hertz bandwidth the time is already quantized into 0.26 second intervals but we don't know necessarily well maybe the the, the delta f is quantized in something other than 3.7 hertz to facilitate another form of detection mechanism. And I'll go through that um, as we go on. And then the point is, is that these signals are signals that fall within uh, the, the definition of what um, David Messerschmitt calls the interstellar coherence hole. It's, a, it's an area where propagation impairments are not present out to many tens of light years. So um, let's see, the next slide talks about methods. So the methods that are used are threefold. The first are individual software that's running on the computers at the locations of the, of the um, uh, telescopes. And, um, and that runs and gets stored away and then gets sent at the end of um, observations. The second step is to say, okay, I wanna search for various time differences and frequency differences and I want to ameliorate RFI. So I want to apply some RFI algorithms to eliminate um, uh, signals that might not be the, these communication signals that we're, that we're looking for. And that allows me to, to say, okay, within a very wide range, like let's say, for example, plus or minus 20 seconds, plus or minus two kilohertz, I'm going to only now store pulse pairs that are within that range then that allows a third step to say, okay, now I'm interested in looking for quantization. So within a much smaller file of pulse pairs, I can then look for the possibility of, is frequency quantized in this? Is there something happening at particular time intervals? Does a delta T value repeat itself again and again and again? And these are all steps that are, that are possible if someone wanted to become, wanted to have their signal discovered. So the idea is that if, if somebody were to transmit these delta Ts and delta Fs with all, all sorts of values because they want to encode a lot of information, 
then it might be difficult to, to detect. And so repetition of those values might be uh, significant in this. Um, there's also been some uh, quite a bit of work on uh, that I've done on, on RFI algorithms, and I'm going to show a schematic or a, uh, a sort of a, a, an example of the uh, types of things that I do to try to get rid of get rid of that. And and there's also things like determining um, really truly when you have two pulses, how do you define the SNR? And I've been using SNR max, the maximum of the two. And in the in the latter work that I've been doing, I produced a metric that goes into that. And the paper goes into the mathematics of how a single metric of SNR can be used. And it's more effective in um, in measuring the the pulse pair uh, signal and noise ratio. Um, the other thing I, I I guess I should say at this point is that the the probably one of the most important things I do is I sort by highest SNR. So because those are the most rare events that are going to occur in noise, I can say to myself, well, let me just take, for example, over a period of 48 hours, the highest 10 or the highest 12 SNRs. And, and I'll, I'll show some uh, results that uh, show that uh, in the next slides. And that's that's sort of where, where this has been going and when it started in 2018. So the next slide um, goes into, um, yeah, the, the RFI methods. So this is an example of the kind of RFIs um, algorithms that I've put into it. So the green lines are RFI that's filtered at the locations of the telescopes. And what happens there is when I was sitting at the telescope at the 60 foot in Colorado, I determined all of the constant RFI. That was just basically always there and then put that into the program and just said, okay, that's all gonna get deleted, okay. The black lines are every 500 kilohertz. There is a possibility of the leakage of a 10 megahertz harmonic or a one megahertz harmonic, or I've even seen 500 kilohertz harmonics. And so those kinds of cardinal frequencies are sort of things that just, I naturally just reject. Um, I don't reject those at the uh, in the raw data that's stored at each site. Um, there's another uh, problem where because I'm now using um, IQ baseband down conversion to an IF using a 14 25 megahertz LO, there's a lot of potential for signals at low frequencies to get into the digitizer path in the IF, and it turns out from about 1424 to about 1426 just I just reject all of that. Um, there's also a 954 Hertz bandwidth filter that says sometimes you get you get this RFI and it moves around a little bit. It doesn't stay constant over time. So so within a um, a period of time, I say, okay, it, it, is this is this signal in the 954 Hertz bandwidth often enough to exceed a threshold? And if so, then that four hours, just I delete that 954. 954 hertz is 256 bins. So those filters are operating. Um, there's also a, um, a burst filter, which is uh, looking for energy bursts. I don't show that on here. I just implemented it. I, I've implemented it in the latter testing, but it's it's not shown explicitly on here. But it's an attempt to say, okay, if a fast radio burst were to come in and just fill the spectrum with a lot of noise, um, just I just throw that away. I throw it away for a right ascension and also for a, a modified Julian day. So during that day and also over that right ascension, it's kind of two-dimensional uh, binning that I do, I reject these bursts that come through. And, and I, I see maybe about, I've seen maybe about 10 of those over hundreds of days. I don't know what's causing them, but they're just, they're, it might be lightning getting into the system somehow. Um, I haven't correlated it with anything, but when I see these bursts, I just reject that data. And uh, and then there is the, um, there's, there's also a 954 Hertz bandwidth filter that operates on a on a ongoing sort of um, updating process, which happens over a short period of time. So if a 954 Hertz filter goes up, it has too high um, an SNR, then I reject that during the period that it is. 
Now, the, one of the problems with this whole <laughs> concept is that it's extremely easy now for the outliers to be falling nearby any one of these processes that's occurring. And if that happens, I don't know that maybe I'm just getting leakage out of my RFI filters. So what I've done is to save files that um, tell me each one of these processes that's occurring as I'm looking at the pulse pairs. So if I see a particular pulse pair, I say, okay, what were the RFI files doing at that point in time? Was this RFI, was this RFI algorithm running? And if so, what was its metric? So each of those has a metric that says it, if it exceeded it, then I'm rejecting something. And I can I post those metrics to output files that I can then correlate against the presence of a pulse pair and decide whether or not to reject that pulse pair. Right now, that's a semi-automatic process. So I reject them based on a threshold, but I don't go back. I haven't been going back regularly. I, I scan the files sometimes in the output numbers to, to say, well, okay, it rejected it, but was my SNR threshold, or was my RFI metric properly set? So that's that's an unknown right now. Let's see, the next slide is a, um, I think we're into observations. So this is what kind of led my attention towards this one particular point in the sky. So the first table is the table of August 15th and 16th. When we ran 48 hours of, um, of a run at Haswell and Green Bank. And this table are the are the five highest signal to noise ratio pulse pairs that occurred within a 3.1 hertz bandwidth. So this is GPS synchronized Doppler offset corrected. And when a pulse occurred at one telescope, the pulse was on the other telescope at the same modified Julian day within a quarter second. And the offsets where the blue arrows are pointing are zero and 0.7 Hertz. Those, if we say over a three point, if we expand out and say over a 3.1 Hertz range, uh, plus or minus, what else happened in the 48 hours of scanning that minus 7.6 declination arc all the way around 24 hours a day? And it turned out there were three other pulse pairs in that. Well, when I saw this in the data, I said, okay, something's funny about 1.8 to 5.25 right ascension, um, and I'm gonna keep looking at it. Well, then April 2nd and 3rd came around. Now, we've had about six or seven simultaneous observations that have occurred, and some of them work, some of them don't work. We use NRAO 5690 for a calibration source to see if the beams are overlapping, uh, supernova remnant. And, and generally, things there, there were some things where it, the beams weren't exactly overlapping. And so some of the data has been rejected from that. On the other hand, you could say, well, all right, you know, there, if, if I did this six times, would that have happened? So we got to multiply anything we calculate in terms of likelihoods by, yeah, it, let's just assume that, you know, all, all none of those occur. It didn't occur on any of them. Okay, well then, then the likelihoods don't calculate to be the same thing. But on the April second and third observations for forty-eight hours, the bottom table shows the right ascensions that had pulse pairs within plus or minus um, fifteen point five hertz. Uh, no, not plus or minus, just zero five point eight hertz to fifteen point five hertz. Now. I can't explain why that particular range is offset from zero. And there are very slight Doppler shifts that occur across the beam. There might also be some effect due to beam offsets that occurred, or there might be something in the receiver in the metrology, one of the local oscillators, something um, that caused a slight offset. But within that 5.8 to 15.5 Hertz offset, there were two additional pulse pairs that occurred in that direction. Now, if we neglect what I just said about how many observation tests and the unknown potential metrology thing that involves, well, why isn't it at zero? Why isn't it centered at zero hertz? Why is it offset? If we ignore those and we say, well, okay, let's just take the highest 
10 signal to noise ratios, which turns out instead of 12, it's actually 10 because of the count. If we take a 12.495 dB for SNR max, the likelihood that you could get four in 10 tries using binomial is like 10 to the minus seven. So to see four occurrences of something within this small range at a particular point in the sky, months and months apart, many months apart, when the stars have moved with respect to time of day, um, is, is a very unlikely event. And so this is kind of something that has caused this direction to be something that I, I continue to look at. So the next slide, so, so now we ask the question, well, wait a minute, if I'm capturing all the data of the SNR thresholds, what else happened during the same quarter second that these simultaneous pulses occurred on the two telescopes? And this is a, ta this is a, a graph of the frequency offset and SNR that occurred for all of the pulse pairs that were captured at Green Bank and Haswell um, uh, plotted and uh, at the same time. So this is in the same quarter second and in, in, the, in a range of up to whatever, a couple of megahertz. So typically what's happening is these pulse pairs are a few megahertz apart. And that's shown by this large cluster over towards the right, where that's showing kind of the average offset between pulse pairs just due to noise. And that's where they're located. So it turned out the first um, item in the table, previous table in the previous slide, there wasn't anything else there. There's there's a small, I, I well, I plotted it at 0.1 because this is a log plot, but it was actually at, uh, I guess, I guess I plotted at 0.1, but it was actually, there was one of them that was at zero hertz. I'm not sure if it's that one. Um, so that's the that's the simultaneous pulse over here with SNR max over on the left. Um, and then there's nothing all the way up to the range at which we expect to see pulse pairs. So there wasn't anything there in this one. Now the second one is in the next slide. Um, so the next slide is the pulse pair, which is the second one, and it's 0.7 hertz offset. Um, and there were two additional pulse pairs that were present that are anomalous away from the expected range of these noise-caused pulse pairs. And those two pulse pairs were offset by about 5.5 kilohertz between sites, between Haswell and Green Bank. And um, each of them was one of the pulses in the pair was at Haswell and the other one was at Green Bank. So, so at the same time that there was a simultaneous pulse on both antenna, there was also a 5.5 kilohertz and then another one close to 5.5. I don't have the number for that one. Um, it looks like it's a little bit below 5.5 kilohertz where one of the pulses in the pair was seen at Green Bank and the other one was seen at Haswell. Um, that seems pretty unusual. It turns out that the line of sight um, convergence of, of the two antennas because of the horizon is about 80 kilometers. So anything below 80 kilometers, if it were to burst from a single source, would not, it would not be seen at both locations. So in order for a transmitter to produce something like this, where an unusual set of pulses are occurring at both locations, it's gotta be higher than 80 kilometers. Now, it, it turns out that, that in addition to that, in order to have zero Hertz of Doppler offset at the two locations, the, the, the signal cannot be triangulated from a single source. If it is a single source, it, it needs to be parallel rays in order for the Doppler to be correct. And, and as, as we say, well, how much does it have to be parallel? It turns out the rays have to be parallel enough to be down in the zero to 0.7 to one bin, 3.7 Hertz range, out to about four times the distance to the moon. So it turns out that the presence of these simultaneous pulses at the two locations, which might be the result of a single pulse that, that is basically being received on both telescopes, filters out distance to a much farther distance. And that potentially can rule out local satellites and things that are above 80 kilometers, but 
um, but uh, further away. Now the beams themselves, they have their own overlap in terms of the beam widths of the antennas, but that comes in quite a bit below the the uh, moon. I, I think it's I think it's a, it's a fraction of the distance to the moon in terms of the beam width effect. We're we're talking about a one degree beam width on the forty foot dish and about a point um, six point seven um, on the um, on the sixty foot dish in Colorado. Okay, so this is pulse number two on the August fifteenth and sixteenth observations. And then the next slide is the April 2nd and 3rd. And this is the first one in that one. And this one is pretty unusual because it has three outliers for a so what I call associated pulses, pulses that seem to be associated with the simultaneous pulse that was seen on both telescopes, potentially from a single source. And those um, uh, two of the pairs were uh, one pulse was at Haswell, one pulse was at Greenbank, and and the third one, the one with a slightly higher frequency offset, was only seen at Haswell, where both pairs were seen on the Haswell uh, telescope, and um, and so this is this is sort of interesting that that the April second and third results also seem to have some anomalies. Um, and we can calculate the probabilities of those things. And, and it turns out to get pretty small because we don't expect to see small offsets between pulse pairs at these distant telescopes. Each one of them is running with its own noise. So it, it should produce random kinds of things up in the one and one and a half megahertz range. Okay, so the next slide is the fourth uh, simultaneous pulse. That simultaneous pulse in the April 3rd produced two anomalies. Um, not quite as significant um, as some of the other ones we've seen, um, but it 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 had one pulse at Haswell, one pulse at, at Green Bank. So that that's been kind of interesting, and and sort of that's been one of the things that's kept this this 5.25 um, our right ascension direction minus 7.6, which I I uh, I'll just mention that that um, I'm not I'm not saying that anything's coming from that location or anything. But um, it, there is a, a, a red dwarf in that area. It's just slightly north of Rigel in Orion, um, and it's Hipparchus 24472, um, about 70, 70 or so light years distant. Uh, they say red dwarfs can have uh, life bearing planets, exoplanets. Um, I looked at the test data for. 24472, and I saw some dips at a few days. And I talked with I've talked with some astronomers about test data, and they said, well, you know, you have to go. It may be that no exoplanets have been announced for that, but on the other hand, you got to go several days, more than just three days, to to confirm that the dips in the in the light curve are actual planets. But I'm not, you know, I'm going to be sort of the tenth or the eleventh person that, after all of this, is saying, well, something is there. I'm going to be still questioning it. So I'm not making any claims to that. And the hypotheses are still based on just having noise that's being augmented with various RFI um, amelioration algorithms. So this is, this is uh, uh, I think these are the observations that complete the things that we've seen with the Haswell and Greenbeck. Oh, now, our, our, the, the latter um, Testing we did was all three telescopes. The 26 foot dish was also running on my farm. And that data is not, um, I, I didn't see anything that was present on all three dishes. There were some things present on, on each of the three, but these two pairs are sort of the ones that I, I find to be the most significant. I mean, these two, two days of observations of defining a particular direction. So let's see, the next slide is observations of Okay, so now I'm running the 26 foot dish on my farm over long periods of time to run 24 seven. And I'm just looking for repetition of particular time offsets. So the Delta T value, if somebody wanted to get my attention, they would transmit that Delta T value repeatedly. And this is an example of, of 143 days of 26 foot telescope data um, where highest SNR is is plotted um, versus right ascension. So, so the 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 likelihood 
of that SNR metric occurring is, is the vertical axis. So the, the points up above are likelihoods that are probably due to noise. And so many of those points along there are probably noise. Um, as the, it's a log, so when you get down to minus four, this is one chance in 10,000 experiments for that particular data point. Um, and then it versus right ascension. And I, I just plotted it as right ascension bin, and I only have six hours on that instead of the full 24. Uh, each one of those bins is 0.3 hours of right ascension, which is a little bit uh, approximately or a little bit larger than the beam width of the antenna that I'm using. Um, and and uh, I see a, a very unusual uh, repetition over the 143 days of, of uh, minus 6.25 seconds. Kind of, kind of unusual. Um, it's got, a, there were 11 pulse pairs that I saw with that offset um, in a range of 400 Hertz of Delta F. So that's, that sort of gets my attention and I try to continue to explain what that is. Then the next slide is, is another um, example of this repetition that I see, which is, I uh, haven't been able to explain, where um, there was repetition at minus 3.75 seconds um, on, on the 143 days uh, as well. And that repetition again occurred um, anomalously in that right ascension bin, the 5.1 to 5.4 hour right ascension bin, and better than one in 10,000 or so, you know, in terms of the likelihood um, resulting from that. The, um, let's see, uh, how am I doing for time, Rich? Uh, you got about uh, four minutes. Oh, yikes, I thought so. So let me quickly show the next slide. Um, so now, I'm, now is, I also start to look for quantization. So the idea is, is that are, are, are any of the frequencies quantized? And I went through and did a similar analysis in that third step, which said, okay, let me look at 58.575. When I try various filters in there, I end up seeing some quantization of the delta F values. Um, and that, it, it, for example, in the minus 6.25 second, offset for delta T there seems to be a quantized. And then the next slide shows another value of quantization where instead of taking it divided by two, 58.575, I did divide by two, now I just do that. And now I'm down into the 10 to the minus six. And so I'm going, okay, quantizing frequency delta Fs by 58.575 and allowing any one of those quantizations to, to occur has this one in a million likelihood of having repetitions of the minus 3.75 second. This could be a pulsar, uh, definitely. But I would expect if it was a pulsar to also see offsets at plus 3.75 seconds because I expect the noise to be random between those two. In other words, the pulse pair should be on either side of the polarization reference that I use. Um, that's highly debatable. So the idea that a natural object could be causing these repetitions is, is definitely there. And in fact, there, uh, an astronomer at a conference I was at uh, a couple of weeks ago, he, he found a pulsar at minus 3.75 seconds at this right ascension, but about 20 degrees off in declination. So I might have a side lobe working for that, but then we end up with the, with the issue of, well, then why isn't it on the other one, on the, on the plus 3.75 second? That's all work that just has to be done and it's, it's, it's ongoing, it's, it's, um, it's a lot of fun. Let's see, the next slide is, um, so the conclusions. So at this point, I'm just saying, you know, I, I don't think this RFI noise model really, augmented noise model really works, doesn't fit the, the observations. So um, gotta keep looking, you know, it's, it's compelling all this additional work. Um, so, I'm, I'm looking at, at corroboration with the Green Bank Telescope, with the Allen Telescope Array, with the Green Bank 20 meter, um, and other telescopes, um, which I've been uh, looking at possibly. And I, I must say that, you know, my dish, my 26 foot dish is not the greatest in terms of surface accuracy. I wouldn't be surprised if I, I'm building another dish, a smaller one, with better surface accuracy. And, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a 20 foot dish could see these kinds of 
repetitions of uh, pulses. And I, I appreciate just anybody who wants to try anything like this. Um, I'd be happy to help out any way I can. So um, let's see, I think that might be it. Um, oh yes, many, many groups have helped me enormously. And I, I thank everybody. Thank, thank everybody so much for all this. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm sorry, I didn't leave much time for questions. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Uh, what was the center frequency of this? All these measurements? Yeah, fourteen twenty-five megahertz. And plus, okay. Plus or minus twenty-five megahertz. Okay. Uh, you should contact me. I have two eighty-five foot antennas that we oh. can look at both of those at the same time, right beside each other. Oh they're my goodness! They're twelve hundred and forty <laughs> feet apart. Oh my goodness, that would be fantastic. I've, I've been I've been working on on trying to get some of the VL, VLBAs, and uh, I've been thinking about putting a proposal in for that. But uh, my yes. goodness, that would be fantastic. Perry.edu. Pardon me. Uh, Perry.edu would be the website. Okay, fantastic. And I'm Thank I'm Don Klein. Mm -hmm. Don Klein. Yes, I will. I will get in touch with you. Thank you so much. Okay, nothing else on chat. Anybody else any comments, questions? I well, thank you very much. Oh, go ahead, James. Uh, I enjoyed his reasoning. I, I think it's pretty neat. I'll have to look more into what his thinking is a little bit, but I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, anybody else? Well, thanks a lot, Skip. I know uh, the guys at the Deep Space Exploration Society love your work, and uh, you've really been a great help to our society. So uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rich.